Welcome, everybody. I have the pleasure of speaking with LFA ring announcer, Mike Kendall. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. And I'm very pumped to get this one done, man. First and foremost, how are we doing today? Good, man. Hey, everybody that's watching. Uh, man, uh, today's a good day, dude. Uh, uh, you know, this is kind of you know, it's my last day home before I go for, you know, we, I'd be head out for the uh, for the LFA in the morning. And uh, and so it's good. You know, it's kind of bittersweet. It's my last day home. But, you know, I'm excited to get on the road. So it's a good day today. Sun is shining. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, it is. We can see that behind you. All right. So you, you're you you're the ring announcer for LFA. And I I wanted to ask you uh, what other promotions uh, you, you have announced for or currently announced for. Well, I uh, have announced for quite a few. Um, there's been a lot of local regional events that that have come through and, you know, come and gone uh throughout the throughout my uh, career um currently with uh the combat sports out of omaha nebraska we do a lot of events in lincoln uh at the pinnacle bank arena same place that the uh, ufc hosted fight nights uh where drew dober had fought um so then we do a little bit of surrounding area shows uh events with with that promotion um also i do a nemesis fighting alliance uh which is a local regional show in St. Louis. Uh, love work, love going out there working with those guys, uh, Brad and Marlene. They're they're awesome people, and uh, the events never disappoint. Um, so I guess currently it's pretty much well that and then Legion Combat Sports out of Western Nebraska. Legion's Legion's pretty good. That's a more of a local local show there out out there. It's kind of it, it pulls a lot of fighters from like the Cheyenne. Denver, Western Nebraska areas. Uh, so those those events are also uh, very well ran. Uh, it all started out with a uh, tournament cage uh, championships. Man, that was a <laughs> that was that was an event. Um, and actually, it, it started with with one singular event that I did for uh, Brad Anderson and his dad Marty Anderson. Uh, in a Midwest champ Midwest Championship fighting, I think it was. It was my first event. That event led to Torment Cage Championships, where I did some more stuff, more like a regional event. But uh, yeah, LFA Dynasty Combat Sports, NFA, uh, Nemesis. I mean, and then uh, Legion are pretty much the ones that I'm solid with still to this day. Okay, and that, I mean that's that's quite a few. That's quite a few. Um, do you have uh, I know I know it's hard to pick favorites, but do you have one that you prefer over the others? <laughs> Man, I hope none of them are watching this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it all started with my guys with Dynasty Combat Sports. Man, I mean, I I, I, I couldn't I couldn't continue this inter interview or have this interview with if it weren't for those guys. Wouldn't be doing the shows that I'm doing with uh, uh, that I'd done with RFA Resurrection Fighting Alliance and now uh, LFA. Uh, without those guys so i mean it's really where home is uh it's uh we 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 have man we, we put on some really good events with those guys and it's kind of been really cool to see these fighters grow up um not grow up literally but kind of develop in the in that entry level stage where you're fighting your first amateur fights and, and it's it's cool to see those guys progress through that organization and then and the next thing you know, they're getting called up to the elephant. I'm like, hey, good to see you again, man. Congratulations and, and, and welcome on your way up, man. And hopefully uh, on to the UFC or Bellator. So but yeah, New Dynasty, that's home, man. When I do when we do fights at the Pinnacle Arena, there's 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 not uh there's not a, a better feeling than that because you're looking up and you see the N on the bottom of the scoreboard for you know Nebraska Corn Oscars and stuff like that. And you're just like, wow, we're in the same place as these you know, college football or college basketball, you know, all those events and stuff are. So it's, it's pretty, it's a, it's a good feeling. However, there's nothing better. Dude, there's not a lot better than, than, than doing an LFA event where you're like, wow, these, these are the future stars. You know that you're witnessing greatness. And these guys like Brian Ortega, who came up through our organization, watching him dominate and then go up into the UFC and dominate, you know, and, and now he's about to make another resurgence too. So excited those those things are 
are pretty exciting events as well. Okay, and uh, do you do like any commentary work or like in, any anything more for these promotions outside of just ring announcers? Because I've seen you at LFA events. And uh, when I was actually doing some research on uh, a fighter that I was gonna interview, that's how I found out that you did some nemesis. And I'm like, oh shit, that's fucking cool. You know what I mean? So, but is there any other hats that you wear for these promotions, like commentary, anything like that? Well, actually, no, I mean, commentary, probably best that I don't do commentary. Uh, <laughs> uh, despite my abilities as an announcer, I'm, I'm not a great impromptu speaker. If if you know what I'm saying, I'm I'm a cue card guy all day long. <laughs> okay, uh, but uh, I do I do wear some other hats. Um, you know, when you're when you're working with you know the RFA and stuff like that and LFA, you want to be as involved as you can. You don't want to just come in and like do a single job and then you're out. You know, I don't I, I never wanted to be like that. I want to work. You know, I'm a 25 year concrete veteran and uh, you know concrete construction, so I, I want to work. So. So I, I was like, hey, guys, anything you guys can have me do that would, that would you know, that could keep me busy while I'm here. I don't want to just sit in my hotel room all day. So uh, I, I help Mark Berry and John Cardenas out with uh, running the weigh-ins and stuff like that. And now that we have COVID testing before every event, I kind of uh, I, uh, I, I make sure that all the fighters get checked in and then get them into the testing facility so that they can get tested. So that is... Uh, that's kind of been my new job is you know another hat that i wear that you know it's it's cool because i get to meet these fighters as they come in and you know the more time you spend with these fighters the more comfortable you are around them and then i think it translates into when i announce them on friday nights so yeah okay and how did you get into this line of work because a you're doing something that i eventually want to do before i kick the bucket right mm -hmm. i've I fought amateur, I have commentated, you know, I do a podcast. So I try to stay as connected to the sport as possible. And there's two things that I think I need to check off the bucket list. And that's refereeing, right? Because I think that that would be kind of cool. And sure. then announcing, which I think would be really fucking cool. So how did you get into this? Wow, oh, dude, that's quite a question. Uh, how much time we got? <laughs> all day, all day. <laughs> ask people because a lot of people ask me they're like wow it's such a unique job like how did how did you do this and it's like well do you want the short answer or do you want the long answer and um i guess it all kind of started you know in, in as a cliche as a sound man this was a dream of mine this is this has been a dream of mine for for as long as i can remember growing up watching the rocky movies and stuff like that having big brothers that kicked the shit out of me all the time i knew i wasn't going to be rocky or apollo you know, so I was like, man, like, well, you know, and, and I always, every time, like, the announcer would get the crowd hyped up and stuff like that, even watching it in, in movies, fake stuff like that, you know, it's like, you get that kind of that, that just that, oh, like that, that feeling, like, I, I've always wanted to be the, the issuer of that feeling, if that makes sense. Um, going to the circus as a kid, uh, watching the, you know, listening to the, the, the ringleader or whatever they call those dudes, the ringmaster or whatever, and, 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 and getting you excited for the next act, man. It's like that always impacted me greatly as a, as a kid. And um, I always wanted to be like that. So I would I would walk around the house and, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, ladies and gentlemen and stuff like that. It kind of it went through, you know, when when Michael Buffer did jock jams and then they did that that song and it's let's get ready to rumble you know like i was in the, in the halls of middle school like like saying that you know doing 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 my michael buffer and, and people are like well wow, you sound just like you know, you know but uh i just always wanted to be that i was a classic clown i was a ham i always like to enjoy you know enjoy saying something and getting reactions so i guess I, to say where it started man it really was childhood um and uh and then into high school i uh i i know i had a good voice i know i knew i could you know um the, the things i can do with my voice are pretty you know cool it's like i can do impersonations and stuff like that i'll spare you today uh but uh i always like to play around with my voice so i wanted to do some radio stuff because i thought that i had I could have a good voice for radio and i went through the programs uh, through the high school there um 
and in del- delve into that. I really enjoyed that. And then one day the teachers pulls me up, uh, you know, pulls me aside. It's like, just want to let you know, you're probably not going to make any money doing this. Like literally like 0.5% of the people that are, that, who are disc jockeys make any money that is worth it. If you're wanting to make a lot of money, this probably isn't a career for you. And I'm like, wow, like, holy shit. Like, that's not what, I mean, this dude is teaching this class, teaching you that there's a career here, but probably shouldn't do it. You know, I always <laughs> thought, that, I always thought that, that was, it kind of blew me away. And I was just kind of like, oh, okay. Oh. And I bought into that a little bit. I, 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 I kind of set it aside and, uh, and, and I just decided that I was going to be an early family man in, in you know, uh, I moved out of my parents' house when I was 17 and started doing concrete back then and uh, did it ever since, you know, did it up until just recently and uh, kind of retired from doing all that stuff. But uh, yeah, so that I was just I was like, I guess this stuff isn't for me, you know. And then I started working concrete for a guy, Phil Henderson, who is actually one of the partners of, this, of Dynasty Combat Sports, formerly Disorderly Conduct MMA. And, uh, and, uh, he had like a clothing line and then, uh, train was managing fighters back then and also helping with the clothing line and stuff like that. So they were kind of just doing like some, you know, behind the scenes stuff for fighters and, you know, sponsoring them, getting their gear out and all that. I was just like, man, I, you know, I've always, I always wanted to be an announcer. I always wanted to be not bring an announcer. Do you, do you guys know any promoters that, you know, could help me out that could get me you know, you know, put me in touch with somebody. I just want to talk to him, see if it's something I can make happen. So I met Marty Anderson and, uh, and I, I kind of did a little demo. I was kind of nervous and I was just like, oh, fuck, you know, fuck it. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to just, I'll just give him my best impersonation. You know, he's like, he's like, wow, man, you, you're, you know, I, I can see it. I can see you doing, maybe doing a show. We have a couple of shows coming up in the, you know, in the near future. And, yeah, I think I think we could do it. I, I really want you to polish your stuff up, but you know, I, let's let's do it. So then I uh, then I was like, oh shit! I was like, oh well, now this is gonna happen. Now I got, I got to figure out how in the hell I'm gonna do this job. <laughs> I guess like anybody that you know that doesn't really know what the fuck they're doing uh, is is gonna you know research, do some research. So I went you know on on Google and I started re- you know research and a lot of the announcers that that I've always enjoyed listening to. So there's obviously Michael Buffer. He's probably my favorite ring announcer. His classiness and his 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 delivery and and, and his just his just that presence that he has he holds when he's when he's talking to the crowd. Never been able to reduplicate that or anything or come close to that, but it's like he's always been that like just that like that that's 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 that level that I eventually want to reach one day and uh, a long way to go. But uh, so he was one of the guys I kind of you know uh, watched some of his you know early stuff and you know more recent stuff at that time, and I really like that. So then there's also Joe Martinez, man. I I had I had a. I watch the WEC fights religiously more than I watch the UFC fights. I watch Uriah Faber and Carlos Condon and, and uh, uh, you know Razor Rob McCullough and all those guys. Uh, and, and that was that was like I was like those are those dudes are hungrier. Those dudes are hungrier than these guys I watch them fight in the UFC. It just it just seemed that way, you know. But Joe Martinez was the ring announcer for them, and he is he's probably he's Joe's a great guy, by the way. Um, I talked to him a few times and he's kind of helped me through some through some issues that I had, you know, in the career. And, but man, he is he's solid as they come. And then uh there's Jimmy Lennon Jr. Man, there's something about the way Jimmy Lennon Jr. talks, his cadence is just mesmerizing, just the way that he talks and you know, just that 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 too. So I kind of took something that I liked from all these announcers that I really enjoyed. And it kind of came up with a mash in a mash of, 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 of it in, in kind of try, but, but tried to make it my own. I didn't want it to sound like anybody else. God, I hope to God I don't never heard that I do, uh, <laughs> which is good. Uh, hopefully people would be honest with me and tell me, but, but uh, came up with that. And then I started doing those. Sh- I did oh, man. And I, Man, I was I can't believe how nervous I was. It was it was intense. It was intense, but got through it, 
relatively unscathed, I believe. And uh, there was another promoter that was there. The torment, you know, uh, torment cage championships was there. They uh, it's like, wow, that was your first event. Wow, that's crazy. Come and do our stuff. And then over the years, it kind of my style and the way that I do things kind of just evolved and. And one show led to another, led to another, it just snowballed, man. Until, uh, like so, you know, here, here's uh, Resurrection Fighting Lines comes along, dude. The rest is history. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, now I was going to ask this one a little bit later in the show, but I can't fucking. Okay. Are you ready for war? <laughs> okay. First of all, I used to come home. After work on fucking Fridays, and I'm fucking glued to Access TV, right? Mm. Watching you do the RFA, and then when there was the uh, merger, which we'll get into a little bit later, um, now you're doing LFA. This Are You Ready for War? They used that for their fight nights. It wasn't just for RFA, it was fight nights. Are you ready for it? You know what I mean? Where did you come up with that line, and how long did it take you? to get it down the way that you wanted it, because that's my favorite fucking line in announcing, hands down. It's better to me than it's time. It's better than me, better. It, I like it more than, you know, what, what the buffers do, what Martinez does, you know what I mean? That, to me, is oh. the best one. So where did you come up with it, and how long did it take you to settle down with it? And was there one before that that, you know, just didn't make the cut? Yeah, oh, man, dude, you're really testing my memory. but uh. Uh, I, there wasn't there wasn't one before that. That was what I came up with. I I didn't have one for a long time, and I was like, you know what? I really want to do. I, I really want to do this. This isn't just a hobby for me, man. If I'm but if I'm going to be, you know, uh, uh, considered an announcer, man, I gotta have, I have to have a tagline, right? So, you know, let's get ready to rumble, man. That. That is, that is, that is like, that's the, the best, that, I think that's the best one out there. I mean, obviously, I think it's probably just because I was so impressionable back when, but I also just like, you know, let's get ready to rumble. Like, fuck yeah, let's get fucking ready. I'm ready. So <laughs> ready, so ready kind of stood, stood out in that, in that aspect. Um, and then Joe, Mar you know, and Joe Martinez is, you know, the, I, I can't, He's probably gonna be mad. <laughs> well, he probably, he probably won't. He's a really good guy. But it's it's he says something like the fighters are ready. The, you know, so and so is ready. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? You know, so it's so it's got to have ready. Or you know, it's, you have to ask the crowd something, you, and you got to get a response. You know, so so are you ready? Okay, well that's that's what you know Martinez says, and I can't say let's get ready to rumble, and you know like, and then. It, so I kind of just I, I set it down for a while and then I was just like I gotta find something that really really tra really really means something to the fighters something that can include the fighters so, you know so it's got to be something that 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 incorporates them because this really is about getting them jacked up and ready to go so you know all the Facebook posts you know and I, I uh, I've I've watched the Ellenbergers fight for a long time. Uh, Joe and and um, Jake. Jesus Christ, man! Are you kidding me? Of course, Jake. Uh, yeah, I've watched them fight. You know, a lot of their fights, most of their fights, and in all the Facebook posts, you know, in and in, in not just the Ellenbergers, but uh, you know, you know, they would say War Ellenberger or you know War Diaz or you know or you know just like. Uh, so it was kind of like a, you know, like a, a battle cry for, for fighters that, that commented on each other's fighters posts and stuff like that. So it's like, are you ready for war? Like, why, like, why not? Like, why not? I in, in that kind of where it, it started, right? It kind of started with, and, uh, I don't know if my delivery has changed over the years. If you, if you watch, if you watch the, the buffers or anybody like that, you can kind of see like in the early days of the UFC that, that the delivery kind of changes it evolves over time I'm, uh, it's interesting to see if i if mine has but i don't know but but yeah i always try to i always try to get it you know uh, get as much out of the crowd as i can and, and get the crowd as loud as i can because it's you know and ultimately 
that moment before the, the main event starts. That's what everyone's there for, mostly. Or the reason why most people are watching. And most of the reason why the scouts, you know, the matchmakers at the UFC and Bellator are watching. So I want I want I want it to be as dramatic as possible. I want I want to get everybody jacked up and ready to go. So I put it all into that. Well, it fucking works because it gets me jacked up every time. <laughs> I'm glad, glad man. Watch it. I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate because I've never been very creative in my whole life, and to, to come up with that, you know, based on influences and stuff like that, it, it, I'm I'm pretty proud of it. The guys at work, the guys at the LFA, they. <laughs> They uh they tease me about it all the time. Mark Berry's like, "Oh, what's your tagline again? Is, Are you ready for s'mores? Like, what is that? You know?" <laughs> I'm just like, "Shut up," you know. But it's funny. It's 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 always been kind of a it's it's always been a cool thing. I, I like that I have a tagline. It's it makes me proud. Well, and also like it identifies. You know what I mean? When somebody hears that they automatically associate it with you or the LFA or RFA or, you know, any of the promotions that you are, sorry, that you um, announce for like it automatically associates you, you know what I mean? Or, or one of the promotions that you've worked with. The first thing that comes to mind, even when I just hear war, I'm like, are you ready for, it? you know what I mean? So for me, like it sticks, you know what I mean? It's very, like you said, you said ready was impressionable. Well, just the word war for me, being in this sport, you hear it all the time, but nobody delivers it quite like you. Well, thank you very much. It's very uh, honored to hear that. That's great. That's that's that that's the idea. I just I want to I want to get it out there. I want to I want to get everybody ready. And it, it is a war, man. I've seen some 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 bloody bloody clashes in in the in the, in the octagon and in uh, other cages, and I, I think it very much you know a bit. It, it's it's indicative of what, what you know what people are about to witness most of the time you know okay now in your line of work there's lots of traveling that has to take place as you go from state to state region to region you know what have you so how does that how does that work the traveling yeah yeah, uh, I mean, got to get there, you know, um, so it, it's it's pretty cool. I, I mean, I, I enjoy traveling. I guess I, I I don't think it's ever been kind of a a burden, um, except for the days where there's layovers and postponed fights and, and, and stuff like that, you know, where it takes 12 hours to get home when you could have driven and gotten home faster. But um, yeah, it's all part of it, dude. And it, uh, you know. I know that I'm successful because of how much I travel in, 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 and so I, I take it as it's, you know, a rite of passage. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you want to get there and go do these things, you, it's, it's one of those things you got to do. You got to spend a lot of time away from home and, uh, and spend a lot of time on the road and it, but it, you know, it has its, it has its blessings and its disadvantages and they're not necessarily disadvantages, but you know, you're living out of a suitcase. You're living in hotels. A lot of a lot of them are good. Some of them are not great. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I enjoy traveling. I, I do. I get that. You know, pre-COVID era, been to some you know pretty pretty cool places. Pretty cool places that we've uh, we've gone and done events at. Stuff I'll never forget. Right on, <clears throat> and. Through all of your travels, is there one place that sticks out or one when they say, hey, we're going back here? You're just like, fuck, yeah, I love that place. Is there do you have a favorite? I never have a favorite. <laughs> I have uh, there. Every, everything is different. There a lot of the a lot of the places I enjoy the most are they're unique to their own, you know, geography, geography. Uh, Favorite place to do events. Now, even though we just did eight fights there, it's it, I love I love Sioux Falls, South Dakota, man. I love it. Not for the vast landscapes, because if anybody knows South Dakota, you know, I mean, it, if you go out west towards the hills and stuff like that, that's that's beautiful country. But you know, other than that, it's just like home. It's cornfields and bean fields and 
but but what I love most about Sioux Falls, South Dakota is that the crowd there is unparalleled to anybody. To any to any other event that we've gone, I've never heard the crowd erupt and be so consistently rowdy throughout an event as I have uh, the Sioux Falls people. Um, that Pentagon Arena is perfect size for our promotion. It, it, it holds like three to four thousand people, uh, and we pack it arm, you know, elbow to elbow every time. Uh, they tailgate our events. That's one thing that I've that I've never I've never seen before. <laughs> Was you, you actually you know you get invited to these pre fight parties that you know um, and people are, have their smokers out and stuff. Everyone wants you to try try this, try this, try this. And, and uh and uh you know the nightlife there is pretty fun too uh, we got wiley's tavern out there right by the hotel that's always meeting and hanging out with that with the staff there is it's always been pretty cool it's been a really good place to go to however i can't i can't i mean even though that is my favorite place to go there my favorite place i've ever been was probably uh, Fort Eustis Lang joint joint base Fort Eustis Langley when we did that uh, 100th anniversary of of uh, Fort Eustis with the army there and uh, wow like that was an amazing event that we did it was I was a huge honor to to be able to kind of usher in their 100th anniversary in a special way we got to do the fight in a Chinook air a Chinook um, hangar. The fighters walked out of the back of a, a Chinook helicopter. It was, uh, it was, an, it was insane. And then, and then uh, the general there, he was like, "Anytime you ever want to get this crowd rowdy up, anytime when you want to hear something, you know, you know, get them loud, you just say, you know, can I get a hua?" And uh, every time I did that, then like six hundred army guys, you know, army personnel were just like, Ooh, and it was just like huge, man. That was just, it was, an, it was, that was a very special event to do. Very amazing. Um, in the in the night was a great. It was a great night of fights on, on top of it all. But uh, we were supposed to go back there. I think this last year, um, but COVID. So, but yeah, uh, first bank, first bank center in Broomfield, Colorado, just north of Denver. Man, that's that's another great place. Uh, that's probably our like more like highest capacity event. It's a it's a pretty good size arena. Um, they're pretty rowdy as well. It's beautiful, man. I love. I love every time I go out to Colorado. It's it's a it's a great experience out there as well. L. A. I mean, I can. The list goes on and on, dude. We get to, we do. You know, you get to go out to the you know West Coast as as a dude from you know that grew up in Texas and now lives in lives in Omaha, Nebraska, most of their life. You get to see the ocean. It's crazy. In that, in the, in the lifestyle, how the how the culture is different out there. It's you feel like you're on a you know in a different country, for the most part. And uh, I love the ocean, man. It's always been something that uh, I've enjoyed uh, taking part in. And and then the LA fighters out there, man. The you know, Los Angeles, you know, there's a lot of talent out there. So the fights are always on point. So, yeah. <clears throat> well. Uh, one thing that I will say about uh, LFA crowds is they're not going to see, I mean, they're going to see UFC caliber fights, but they're not going to see UFC caliber namesakes, right? So they're not going to see your Uriah Favors or your Carlos Condits. They're going to see your uh, your Sam Hughes's or your, your Justin Willis's, you know what I mean? Yeah. So these not only are they there for specific fighters, but I feel that they're a lot more knowledgeable because they're going to a smaller show as opposed to where, you know, the UFC just bleed guys, you know what I mean? Where they're just there for violence here. I feel that at the smaller shows, even here locally for the promotion that I actually commentate for, um, like it just seems like the crowd is a lot more knowledgeable because they're there, not just as a, a fan, but as, you know, a training partner or a family member, you know what I mean? So there's a lot more invested into each fighter, which I think translates into a better crowd. Sure, definitely more fans of the sport in, in, the, in the feeder leagues. Um, you know, and there's a lot of people that go to UFC fights just because of the UFC event. You know, like you, like you said, uh, 
Uh, I, I believe that's that's a that's a true statement that you're that you're that you're saying there. Um, but uh, there's definitely some yahoos that come to our events as well. <laughs> You can hear it in the because Pat and Ron never never hesitate to point them out or to talk about them or to you know blast them on 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 air. So, but but yeah, man, it, the, our, our crowds are great, dude. And um, it is you know these are these fights are the you know the up and comers. These guys are hungry. It's a lot in a lot of ways, you see more tenacity in the cage with our guys, with our with our fighters. You know the men and women that fight in our uh, in our events, do uh, in the UFC. And not and shit, as you've seen in the UFC, they're they're pairing, you know, legacy ver, legacy vet versus RFA vet, or you know, or LFA vet versus LFA vet. So it's like, in a lot of ways, the 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 UFC's because you know, you can see how we can see how we're you know starting to kind of build you know the, build that roster there. And I mean, the last time I heard any numbers and stuff like that, like that the UFC is like you know twenty five percent of them have come through our organizations one way or another. So. So that's also you know pretty you know pretty cool thing to, to be a part well, of. I've seen, I've seen fight cards where it's seventy percent or higher, uh, just legacy RFA LFA, uh, you know alumni. You know what I mean? So that's pretty cool that you know you've in some way you know as you know as the ring announcer or as the promotion or as a friend, you in some way have gotten so many fighters to these bigger stages, and not just the UFC. You guys have sent fighters to Bellator. You guys have sent uh, fighters over to one, to Brave. You know what I mean? So it's not just, you know, the one organization. You guys you guys build rosters everywhere. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Um, and that credit, credit to that goes to, I mean, of course, Mark Berry, man. He's like, he's the matchmaker of matchmakers, dude. He's, he's, he's very talented at what he does. He, he puts... You know, his his thing is styles make fights. You know, it's a very common coin phrase, but like Mark puts it on, put, puts it, makes it a reality. Um, of course, Sven and Ed, you know, Ed Soares, those guys, they they have a lot to say with what kind of cards we put together as well. But uh, yeah, it's our staff. Dude. Our staff finds these these guys, and we 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 put the best from here against the best from here, and you know. That's the way it should be. Let's see, let's see what happens, and um, and then and then especially nowadays, you're able to do that a lot more, you know, because you're not having to sell the tickets. You know, you're not having to put that ticket seller on, on, on the fight. God bless them. I mean, it's good. It, the, the, without them, you know, in a lot of ways we wouldn't have you know uh, events. But uh, when you when you don't have to sell those tickets to people, you know, or, you know, to to run it to make an event happen, you're able to pit this you know this badass versus this badass you know and that's the way it should be you don't have to worry about who you know oh, i don't want to you know you know i want to win in my hometown that like, type stuff yeah and i kind of like that about what's been going on i like i like that aspect of, of, of what what this kind of covid era and whatever is, has kind of brought on but still can't wait to get it back to normal yeah absolutely okay now you're in the public eye a lot, right? So what types of things do you do outside of your job to keep, you know, to keep yourself mentally focused, to keep yourself physically in shape? What are some things you do to, I've, I've seen you post uh, about your workouts and stuff. So what are yeah. some things that you do to keep yourself as well as you can? Well, you know, and, yeah, I, I I do I love working out, man. I, I do. I've, it's ever since I was younger, I've always wanted, I've always loved working out. Uh, just not very consistent these days. Um, and post concrete work, I'm you know, I definitely should be doing a lot more, but I'm not. But uh, I, I do. I, I enjoy working out. I, I enjoy, you know, especially when when I am on the road. I work out with Pat, you know, frequently, and, and uh, he puts you to the ringer. But. Uh, uh, but yeah, that working out is definitely a huge thing. Something I really want to continue to do more of, just staying motivated and stuff. But uh, I love hunting and fishing, man. Uh, grew up in the sticks. I've always, you know, always been a, you know, put my, you know, put a line in the water kind of guy, just relax and, and just kind of soak up, 
you know, nature. I love fishing. I love hunting. Love hunting birds. Uh, went out and got uh, turkey. We doubled uh, doubled up with Dakota Bush. You just fought in, in our last our last event. Dakota Bush. We went out and doubled up on two turkeys pretty early in the you know in a spring turkey hunt a couple of years ago. And yeah, there's nothing better. It's just it's that 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 natural you know caveman instinct stuff. It's good to get that stuff. You know, to get that out of your system and to keep it coming. Okay. Okay. Um, now, do you train? Okay. You said you, tra- you you work out with Pat. So what type of workouts do you do? Or do you like do any type of cross training in any of the aspects of MMA? You know, maybe rolling, uh, boxing, anything like that? Man, it, 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 I, I definitely have, you know, over the years, just nothing consistent. I, I've, I've never, you know, I, I've, when I started announcing fights, my brother was a professional fighter back then, and uh, he was a, a local champion. And he's like, "Mike, you got if you're gonna do this, dude, you got to know what you're talking about." So I was like, "You know what? You're right." So I definitely went and started, uh, you know, working out in gyms, doing classes and doing jujitsu classes and stuff like that. But just never with with life the way it was, and being, doing con- concrete construction. There's not a lot of energy left. You know, after working a 16, 18 hour day, uh, pouring concrete all day to to go and do these things. So it's never been, I never anything I, it was never anything I was able to develop consistently for a long period of time. But I've, I've always gone back to it. I've always, I've always, you know, I get back in there. Like last year, I started doing some jujitsu at a gogi here in Omaha. And that was, you know, that was beneficial. It, it was, you know, it's good to, to do that stuff. Um, I would definitely love to do more of that. Uh, working out with Pat, uh, it's more calisthenics and stuff like that. He has these, like, we're going to do 200 squats today. We're going to do 1,000 squats today. And I'm like, I can barely squat over to put my socks on right now, Pat. <laughs> you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. But, uh, but yeah, he put a lot of Tabata stuff, a lot of power hikes on the treadmill and stuff like that. But, uh, the stairs, bro. Oh, shit. <laughs> the stairs. Uh, he loves doing stairs. My body doesn't, but he loves it. And so, but it's a challenge, man. He challenges me, and it, and it makes me want to do it. So, if Pat tells you to do something. I can do it. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. agree. You know, he's a, he's a little bit uh, older these days, but uh, he's still a fucking animal. Dude, his strength, man. His his strength is still there. He's still got. He's he's a powerful, powerful man. Don't let look, don't let the gray hairs on his face deceive you, dude. He's very. He's he's a, he's very much still a stud. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Now, have you you've you've trained right, and and you call fights. Has there ever been a desire to compete in MMA? Yes. Not so much anymore these days because I've kind of hit that. You know, I'm 40 plus years old now. Um, but uh, yeah, about six. I can't, I can't remember. I have the worst memory, by the way. But uh, about six years ago, I blew my uh, I blew my uh, ACL out at a five finger death punch concert in the mosh pit. That I cleared out, by the way. I cleared a mosh pit out. There was literally no one in there, and I called them all pussies and then. Some big dude came and hit me in the mosh pit, and then someone took my legs out, blew my shit up. But uh, yeah, that right before that happened, I was actually I was I was working out, I was training, I was I was really uh, I was about to put a camp together just to do my first amateur fight, and uh, that event happened, and kind of put a kibosh to that. And uh, I, I I went I would think I went like five years without getting the surgery done, and it was just. There was no, uh, there was no ability to do any, to do anything athletic, just because it was a full thickness tear. It was gone. It was just, it, it kept my my knee kept dislocating, and I'd have to pop it back in. Just doing stupid, you know, getting out of bed, you know, just the pressure, you know, from the mattress would pop it out, and all the torn cartilage that I had in there. It really kind of it hindered anything like that happening. Finally, was able to get the surgery done, and then by then, you know, I'm 40 years old. And, I don't want to put myself too, 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 
I mean, I kind of do. I mean, I do. I mean, I think that I think that, that you know the stint that I'm on right now. If, if I if I were to get my body super lean, get all this weight off, because I'm a 290 pound man. If I can get all of this weight off, there's a there's a possibility that I could you know I could do something like that, but it would be short lived, man, because my body's pretty much destroyed these days. So, well, all the concrete and the mosh pits, you didn't do yourself any favors. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do yourself any fucking favors, man. Uh, no, man, no, especially the concrete, dude. And, uh, yeah, I was, I wasn't. There, there's plenty of people say that well i know people that have been doing concrete for 40 years it's like not the way i worked if the way i worked was i had something i had to prove i had a brother that was that, that played the nfl uh my other brothers went to school on full ride scholarships for state champions like I, I grew up in a household of full of studs and uh and and i due to some injuries through my childhood i, I wasn't i wasn't I wasn't going to measure up to that. But I still had that drive and that desire to be really good at something. And so when concrete presented itself, I was like, wow, I can make money. I can work out. I'm in a different place all day. I work outside. I get a tan. I was like, it was like, it was a dream job, dude. I loved it. Loved it. I loved it so much that my first day, I, I worked so hard. I got like a dollar raise my first day. And uh, I did that by, by just really sacrificing my energy and all the, and, and, and to just get the job done fast and efficient. And, and, uh, I, I learned it from getting, you know, from that, from that, from working that hard, getting that reward that that, that was what I was going to do. And I, I, I just want, I wanted to be the most valuable person on the job site at all times. And, uh, and because of doing that, I kind of, fucked my body up pretty bad over the over the years and you know you want us to leave somebody to help you finish this basement no i got it all by myself oh wow are you sure yeah i got it and i and i just taught myself to just to, to work that hard and i really burnt i burnt the candle out pretty fast working like that so 25 years was actually probably anybody else's 35 40 years so yeah it, i mean I, I know what you're saying. I used to work overnights uh, in a freezer. So, and like you said, long hours, you know, doing shit where it's like, you know, no, no, no. You want to go home? Go home. I got it. You know, get out of here. I got it. You know, not taking help. You know, when somebody offers a hand, it's like, no, I got it. Don't need your help. You know what I mean? Sure. So the unfortunate thing about my situation is I did that for nine years uh overnight in a freezer so anytime i'd go out into the sun would die <laughs> i would i literally like dude this is tan buddy this is super tan okay <laughs> it took more than two years for my body to just get used to getting more than like two minutes of sunlight because for real it i would go outside right even just to smoke a cigarette or you know fucking go get the mail when I got back inside, I needed to lay down because the sun just killed me. Like, it's the weirdest fucking thing. You know what I mean? And then whenever, like, my body would heat up, like, uh, when I was at work, I would, I'm in a freezer. I'd have to take my jacket off because I'd be breaking out in highs because my body got too hot. Wow. Yeah, it's fucking stupid. But anyway, so you can only do it for so long. You know what I mean? Like. You can only push your body to the limit so long before, you know, it starts to break down. So I, I understand what you're saying. And, and, and what you're saying about the going out, and you know, working in the freezer and going out in the, in the heat. It's the same thing working all day in the heat and going into the air conditioning. Like I for the longest time, I, I never ran my air conditioner in my vehicle just because like that was it, it was such a sh it was it was a sh it was a shock to your body. So. If I if I went into an air conditioning building, I was done for the day. Because once you go into the air conditioning, you go back in the sun. It's like your coat hanger in your body. You're just you just you're just asking it for it to just break. So, and, and I, I so I get exactly what you're saying. Air conditioner was is the enemy when you're when you work out in the sun and in, in, in hot climates all day every day. So, good point. And vice versa, I couldn't do anything without air conditioning. I couldn't <laughs> like. Don't get me wrong. I fucking love air conditioning, man. I, I, I mean, I'm a fat kid. I'm a fat kid. I love air conditioning. 
I just can't do both. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So between the the announcement of the show, right? And then, you know, all the pre-fight buildup, you know, they shoot their promos and then you go, you guys are pushing everything online, you know, especially these days online, social media is extremely important. Uh, you know, not just due to like, you know, the times being changed, but especially COVID, you know, where nobody wants to go outside and then you've got the weigh-ins and then finally you have the event. How much work actually goes into this where as a spectator, you see the flyer, you purchase your ticket, you go watch the fight. You know what I mean? So for a spectator, it's very easy for us. But for the guys that are putting on the promotion, I mean, you get to see from fucking start to finish. You know what I mean? You get to see the whole product. So how much work actually goes into that, that us, you know, fucking casuals that are just watching, like how much of that actually goes on? Well, I mean... I'm definitely not part of the whole process. Uh, there's a, there, I mean, for instance, when I show up to an event and I'm starting to, you know, I'm getting the fighters through testing and stuff like that. And Mark shows up and Mark's already working on LFA 98, you know, or 99 and stuff like that. He's, he, damn, Mark Berry is probably the hardest working person I've ever known. And, and it's only because I spent so much time with him. I know. That there's some people in our organization that are busting their asses too. I just don't, I just don't, I don't see it firsthand. Um, sure. But there's, there's a, there's a ton of stuff, logistics, you know, with, uh, you know, getting that, getting events and uh, scouting locations and stuff like that. And all the, you know, the, the red tape that you have to go through, you know, with commissions and, I mean, there's there's so much stuff, you know, lining up ambulances, you know, doctors, all those things. Those are those are things that have to be done so far in advance that, you know, so like there's it's just like it's a constant grind, especially when you when you're churning out as many fights as that we do a year. Um, there's so much stuff that's constantly going. They're constantly working. Uh, Mark Berry and Sven and, and Ed, those, those guys are. I mean, always, always working. I mean, it, it, it doesn't stop. You know, there's never, a, you know, the, the days of doing, you know, like these these local regional amateur shows and stuff like that that are, that happen every four months. You know, there's definitely, you know, put on the event. You, know, you can relax, you know, and, and, and do whatever. But like when you get to the level when you're doing 20, 30 fights a year, it's it's nonstop. Um, but uh, yeah, it it, it uh, there's so much stuff that goes into that. Uh, just just the stuff that I do. I mean, and and, and I don't, I don't do any prep work per se before I get to an event, other than just kind of paying attention to the press releases that kind of come out and getting to know the fighters that way. Um, but to those those guys that you know that are that that aren't in the camera, those are the guys that are putting in the most work. You know, along with the fighters. Man. It's like. You see, it, it, to kind of put it into perspective, is like the fans see that seven second to twenty five minute fight, but they don't see the eight weeks. You know, a typical camp is that they put hours and hours and hours and hours and hours into just preparing themselves for that five second to twenty five minute fight. Same thing goes on. It's a very much the same thing with the production staff. I like the way that you put that, you know what I mean? Because a lot of people, you know, will just use uh, when uh, uh, Roy Val won his uh, LFA flyweight title. You know what I mean? The fight was so fast. It was, you know, a lightning quick finish. And yay, you know, celebrate, whatever. You know what I mean? I like Rod Dog. Great guy. You know, I've had him on the show. But just talking to him and seeing the work you know what i mean not seeing the work but just him explaining to me the work that goes into it that's why i, I enjoy you know giving fighters a platform and and doing everything i can for certain you know promotions and whatever because there's a lot of work that goes into it that's you know what i mean that's happening behind where nobody can see you know Absolutely. what i mean so i like your your comparison to a fight camp you know what i mean uh, in comparison to your your guys' shows and stuff. 
The only difference I would point out is, and you did say, was that you guys are doing, like, once their fight is over, they get to relax. Once your guys' night is over, you guys literally have to go to the next one. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're already working on two or three events simultaneously, you know? it's And, and we do it with a pretty small staff, man. You know, if, you look, if you look at the staff that, like, you know, in the, that like the UFC or Bellator have so you, just the amount of people that they have personnel wise. Like we do it. Like we're such an efficiently ran well old machine, dude. We have probably 12 to 13 staffers, you know, people that are, that, 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 that do everything in and, in and, and a, a very, very small number of those are guys that do most of the work, you know? So it's, it, they, I, I, I I can't even fathom all the stuff that those guys go through. Just email after email after email, phone call after phone call. Literally hanging out with these guys is probably, you know, it's, it's just like, oh, he's got another phone call. I guess we'll finish this conversation in March, you know, or what, or something like that, you know. It's just, it's a constant, constant grind, constant grind. Well, and you had mentioned uh, lining up the ambulances and, uh, at one of your guys' events that I was there covering his media, uh, one of the guys, I guess, in the fight, he hurt his neck. I think his name's like Bruno Silver or something like that. Um, he was fighting uh, Mike Camel, and uh, they stopped the fight, and they carry this dude off in a stretcher, and there's no action for a, an extended period of time. And Ryan's sitting at the table next to me, and I'm like, Ryan, like, what, what's going on? What happened? And he's just like, uh, you know, dude got hurt, uh, something with his neck. They had to take him to the hospital. And we literally couldn't restart the fights until a second ambulance got there. But that ambulance got back. You know what I mean? So something like that small, like I said, that a spectator doesn't even think about, especially when you're at home. You're like, why is there so many commercials? That fight ended a long time ago. And it's like there's more to it than just you know getting the next fight on there's red tape you know what i mean there's commissions there's ambulances that you have to set up you know what i mean so that was my first experience with it like you know firsthand i had been to plenty of shows but never had something like that occur to where the ambulance like actually had to take somebody right then and there and we couldn't get the next fight started sure yeah and, and, and you know there's a lot of you know, commissions have a lot of rules and regulations for the safety of our fighters because let's say, you know, let's say let's say the very next fight someone gets hurt the same way or worse, you know, it's it, what what's gonna happen. You know, you, you can't let that dude just sit there, you know, waiting for that for people to get back. So you know I think a lot of times we line up two two uh two paramedic uh, squads at the same time. Uh, a lot of times we have two doctors because you know the fights can't go on unless the doctor's cage side. If he's tending to someone back in the in the uh, backstage or in warm warm up rooms, uh, yeah, nothing nothing can go on until until every you know, all the personnel are lined up back in place and, and then it's safe to resume. Like I said, there's a lot of things that you know spectators don't have to think about that you guys have to keep on the forefront to keep the fucking wheels going you know what i mean mm -hmm. now sure. this is something that i struggle with just on my show is pronunciation <laughs> okay this is like okay there are very few people that actually have to worry about this and that's ring announcers commentators and then dickheads like me that you know <laughs> just want to do their own show you know what i mean so and I'm really, really horrible with it, um, especially because I have a real shit memory. So if I don't remember how John Anik or Mike Kendall or Joe Rogan pronounced it, then I'm just going to have to fucking wing it. And I butcher him nine times. One time I called a guy COVID. That happened. <laughs> yeah, I called the guy COVID. So how do you... Like, how do you figure all these names out? Because you don't just deal with, you know, your typical, you know, uh, Brandon Roy Vals or Sam Hughes or, you know what I mean? You deal with, like, I think it was Oscar, Oscar. I, I kept calling him Asker. You know what I mean? So it's like, how do you figure it all out? 
so this is another blessing of the uh, you know of of trying to wear as many hats as possible doing the testing and, and then kind of uh being the liaison to the for the fighters getting them through the green screen photo shoots i also get them into their interviews with pat and ron and i get them to their uh you know to our the lfa photographers for headshots and stuff like that i spend a lot of time with the fighters and i talk to them I, when they check in with me i i always first thing what uh what's the last name and I, so I check them on the list and it's like so how say it for me again say it for me again and i'll repeat it and i was like they're like yeah that's good enough i'm like no 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 i, I want to i just repeat it and, and let me really really get it i want to say it the way you say it the way that your parents say it the way that your country people would, would say it so i spent so i get that one-on-one -on -one, that face-to-face -face time where i'm at, i can hear them i can watch them how they how they move their mouth when they pronounce their name um, it gives me a huge advantage when it comes to, you know, and then also when we were doing uh, weigh-in, uh, weigh-ins, uh, uh, live weigh-ins, you know, you know, face-offs and stuff like that when we were broadcasting those, uh, it gives me another, you know, initial chance. Uh, sometimes if they had a real difficult name, I'll, I might mess it up and they'll tell me, hey, you know, it's nothing right. You know, I'm like, okay, get it tomorrow. I promise you I'll get it by tomorrow. But it's that one-on-one -on -one time you're spending, that you spend before the cameras, you know, turn on that, that you're able to, to lock all that down. And a lot of times on my cards, I'll, I'll write it phonetically. Uh, I'll, I'll write it the phonetical way. I won't even spell their name on the card correctly. I'll just, I'll, I'll write it on there the way I would say it so that I don't mess it up. Yeah. It's, that's, you know, again, one of those things that, you know, us yahoos aren't going to see, you know what I mean? We're just going to turn on our camera and pronounce it however the fuck we pronounce it. You know what I mean? I have one job. It's to say their name right. So if if I can if I if I am do that, I don't have no business being in this job. I mean, you guys have con you know other content. You guys got discussions that you got to do. You guys have so much other stuff. You just the the, the pronunciation the pron pronunciation. Oh God, I can't speak. The pronunciation of a man's name is 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 you know it's it's, it's important, but it's definitely not the meat and potatoes of what you guys do along with commentators um i have one job it's probably the easiest job in mma it's just to, to announce you know to, to say these words these few words on a card correctly well i wouldn't say that it's the easiest job i wouldn't say that it's the easiest job because if you have a flat performance the crowd is gonna feel it you know the audience that's watching on their tvs is gonna feel it and you know It'll translate. It, it'll translate into you know a fighter falling flat. You know what I mean. So I don't necessarily think. I think your job isn't the easiest. I think it's like there's a sweet spot that you have to be in order for the night to go well. Because if commentary's flat, you know what I mean. If if cage announcing is flat, if uh, you know promotion is flat. Like all these things are going to affect the actual fights themselves, because when I competed, the cage announcer like said my name wrong, said my record wrong. I could hear him. You know what I mean? And now I'm not thinking about the fight. I'm thinking about the way that this guy just butchered my fucking name. Five <laughs> seconds later, I'm getting hit in the face. You know what I mean? So it can take you out of you have to be perfect to set these guys up so that they're only thinking about the fight. You know what I mean? It's it's not an easy job, what you do. It's definitely not. And this is coming from somebody who got into a cage with somebody who's been training to kill them because that's what cage fighting is. These guys train for you know weeks, if not months, to just fight you. You know what I mean? So if you throw me off by pronouncing my name wrong, well, that, that guy automatically got the upper hand because all I'm thinking about is my name is not Fruit Roth. What are you saying? You know, <laughs> who the fuck hired this guy? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm not saying that my career would have gone any differently. Hell no. I, I was a fucking shitty fighter. But, you know, simple things like that will play into your performance. And I can only I can only say that I know that from experience, you know what I mean? So it's not easy. It's not easy, especially when, 
you know, you're announcing a, a title fight where these guys are literally fighting for a chance to move on to the next stage. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not going to throw any announcers under the bus, but, you know, I've gone to some events. It's very tough sometimes to go to these events and listen to people announce, try to, or try to, uh, and it, it, I, I get, and I'm, I guess, like I said, like, like I said, when you, when you do something for a living and you watch someone else do it, you're severely more critical, you know, ultimately more critical of what they, of what they do. Um, so I, I, I understand from an, a, just from a ring announcer's perspective that bad announcing uh, can dim the shine of a great event or great fights, you know. If you're putting on great fights, you want it to sound great. You want every, you want everything, the production, everything. You want it, you want it to be indicative of what of, of the content you're putting out. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've heard some. Gosh, man, the, I went to the I went to one event uh, that I think I was gonna announce. I think they double booked me. I've been double booked a couple of times, by the way. But uh, uh, they they had this other guy do it and he actually he actually used the are you ready for war no he used the let's get ready to rumble and me and my fighter buddy that I was with josh smith at the time <laughs> we were like bro you get come here man come here dude uh, you can't say that you can't do that stuff and this guy's not his name's not uh you know it, it, he, and he was mispronouncing shit left and right and it's just like, like some people just some people just want to, to do this this is way more than just a uh uh, an experience that I want to that I want to experience. It's it's a it's a it's a career now. This is all I do for a living now. Is it's serious? It's serious to me. And, and when people hire these radio DJs that they think are going to be great announcers, some of them are. I mean, I'm I'm not saying they're all they're all not, but um, there's definitely some that that doesn't translate. Being able to talk on a microphone on the radio in front of nobody is way different than 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 live speaking in front of, you know, hundreds to thousands of people in, in, in the heat of the moment and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely, yeah, I can understand. Like I've seen fighters get their names pronounced wrong and they're like, like you're automatically unfocused. You're, you're on, like you said, you're, you're unfocused. And, you know, little things like that are, you know, they're important, but you know, they, they happen all the time. <laughs> Man. Okay, so have you ever made a mistake that was more than noticeable? <laughs> oh, I've been dreading this part of the interview the whole time. <laughs> uh, yes. My very, very first event that I did on TV, LFA 4, Las Vegas, Texas Station Casino. Eight years ago, wow, I was nervous, sweating. Not from the desert heat or anything like that. It was an air-conditioned casino. Just sweating the whole time. I was just like, gosh, don't make a mistake. Don't get nervous. Don't look at the camera. If I look at the camera, I'm going to freeze. You know, like all the things that were going through my head, man. I was just like, don't fuck up, don't fuck up, don't fuck up. So they're like, all right, Mike, here we go. And I'm I'm standing there. I'm standing in the middle of the, of the octagon. I got my microphone, and they're like, "Okay, we're going to come to you in three minutes. We're going to come to you in two minutes. We're going to come to you in a minute. All right, thirty seconds." And I'm just like, my hands are just leaking, dude. Like I can barely hold on to the microphone. Just uh, you know. But then I'm like, he's like, Mike, you're you're nervous. Smile. Take a breath. Take a deep breath. You're going to be just fine. And this was Sergio Pettis versus Joe Pegg. Okay. And uh, and I'm seeing them stage the fighter. And I'm looking at my card. And I'm like, that's not them. Ten seconds, Mike. I'm like, that's that's not that's not him. I'm like, and I'm and I want to like and I want I want to like say. My card's wrong. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, ladies and gentlemen, making his way to the octagon, Joe Payne. Sergio. Sergio was standing in the in the in the the, the walkout 
where the lights are. And he's just like, just like we had, just, just like the, you know, that, you know, what we were talking about, like, whatever, the officer fucks up. Like, I'm living that, right? In that very moment. And he goes, Mike, that's not, that's not him. Please say Sergio Pettis. And I'm just like, <clears throat> instantly just pools of sweat. Like I'm lit, like I'm, I'm living out my worst nightmare ever in my whole life. Like, wait, John making his way to the octagon, Sergio Pettis. And, and they're like, it's okay, Mike. It's okay. And I'm just like, fuck, 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 fuck. I'm fired. My my career is over. This is it. I'm done. And and so the fight happens, and I'm and it's the fight starts. I'm walking back to my seat. I'm just like, son of a bitch, you know. <laughs> Sven Sven Bean comes over to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder. <laughs> I can't even I can't even remember what he was said what he said. I was so mad, but it was something. To, it was something along the lines of man, I I saw I saw you turn. Like ghost white and sweat literally just like beat up on your on your head and start pouring down your face. And I was just like, yeah, man, that was just the worst thing. I'm so sorry. I wouldn't I won't be mad if you guys don't want me to come back ever again. And I'm like, no, you'll be fine. Just don't do it again. And then and right then and there I had a little conversation with myself and I was like, fucking not nah, gonna do that ever again. But what happened was is that, is that I don't know if I I don't know if I had a an accurate fight card or something like that. I had the names transfer, you know, transversed on my card. And I've always, you know, I, I read that, I read this, then I read this fighter stuff, then I read this fighter stuff. It's always just methodical. I just follow it this way. But I had the, I had a backwards dude. And I was just like, it was a Ron Burgundy moment, man. It's like if it's if it's written on there, you gotta fucking say it. Like I've had a couple of, you know, not not so not so dramatic moments like that. I'm, I'm actually calling the wrong fighter out on TV. That's that was the biggest mistake I've ever made. Um, but I've announced the wrong, you know, on, on in, earlier in my career, I've announced the wrong winner a couple times. It happens, man. That's it. Very, you know, today is human. I'm uh, definitely really, really human. Yeah, but that one, that was the, that was the one. That's the one. That was, God, man, it was the first thing I ever did on TV, man. The first thing I ever did on TV was a fuck up, dude. So just gotta, you know, but it was very humbling because, you know, I was starting to get that attitude like, wow, man, I'm gonna be a fucking professional MMA ring announcer on television for a professional company. Like, this is it. This is the big deal. This is my dream come true. It, it really was. And, and, you know, God has a funny way of saying, not today. <laughs> you know? So, um, but yeah, dude, I, and I, I needed that because it sat me right back down. I was like, you know, what? if you're going to have that type of attitude, you probably don't deserve this job anyway. And so I was just like, you know, I'm going to take it seriously from now on and, and really double check, triple check, make sure all my shit's right. Accuracy is important. Accuracy yeah. is important. You know and now I mean? the, yeah. And now, and now we have, you know, the people that do our production, the people that do our green screens and stuff like that, they talk to the fighters and they get all their information and all the information that's, you know, fact checked and all that stuff or whatever. And then it's, it's delivered to me on a sheet. So like everything that I'm supposed to say is boom, right there on the sheet. I just got to transfer it to a, to an index card. So, and, uh, but yeah, but that was back when I used to interview the fighters, you know, get all the information myself. Mm -hmm. And you know, I made mistakes on here and there, but yeah, I still make mistakes. Ask Ed Soros. He, he tells me every. He tells me before every event starts, "Don't fuck up, Mike." <laughs> <laughs> and usually, when he says that, I, I'm doing pretty good. Sometimes when he forgets to do it, I, I fuck up. It's like I, I don't know. I make small, small mistakes, but yeah, I think well, it's important. Little mistakes, so you're not perfect. Because if I did, I would probably have a huge ego, and I don't want that. Well, also, like, I mean, these guys are keeping you on your toes. They're making sure that you know you're you're crossing your T's and dotting your eyes. You know, what I mean, it's it's a you know a whole group effort. It's not just you know one guy. It's you know they're making sure you have the accurate information so that way you can transfer it to your cards and put on a good show. All these little details, like they, they matter. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I want to, I want to put on as good a, 
put on a good as good an event as, as as what everyone else is doing. Everyone else is doing their job and doing it right. All the fighters, they put so much prep work into this stuff. I mean, it, for me to not take it seriously would be a travesty. You know, it'd, it'd be horrible for me to think that I could make it through this, you know, career not putting in the work to make myself better when everyone else is, especially the fighters. So I want I want my work to reflect the quality of the event that we're putting on. That's that's my strive every time. Well, I think you do a pretty good job. And, you know, before, you know, you were doing local shows and then you got with RFA. And now uh, with that merger uh, into LFA, like how smooth was that transition? Because I know it was two companies coming together. So there was, you know, two announcers. There was almost two of everything. Um, how, How did that all? Yeah. How did that all work out? Man, uh, I guess it goes back. I mean, I, gosh. So you know, I can I can only speak to it, speak about it from my perspective. Uh, sure. A lot of the things you know, there's a lot of. It was it was it was interesting, man. It was it was, it was exciting at first, man. It, it really was. It was it was like wow, like we're we're gonna you know all we're gonna do this. We're gonna we're gonna all meld together, and everything's gonna work. You know, it's just gonna be we're we're growing, we're getting bigger. Everything's gonna be this and that and that. And um, it started out, you know, from my perspective, it was gonna be Colin Cantrell and I were gonna we're we're gonna basically each like all the RFA. Um, what are they? The the markets. So like Denver, Omaha, uh, L.A. Uh, like so, like RFA. The RFA staff was going to work those market events, and the legacy staff was going to work like the Texas fights, the the Louisiana fights, okay, the Oklahoma fights. And it started out with the, 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 what we. That's what we were going to do, and. Um, I guess there was a, that, uh, the higher ups kind of had a, a discrepancy on the continuity of the ring announcer of, of having that, you know, th- that there, there should probably just be one just, you know, and, and I was like, you know, I was fearing that, you know, that, that there's a possibility I might do less shows or none at all, you know, mm-hmm. Colin Cam- a great ring announcer. Uh, and he's also he was he's also he was also the matchmaker for the legacy so like that that dude was very super important and i was just like man and all i do is bring to the table is announcing fights i mean i could be on the chopping block you know but it, it you know it turned out that uh that 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 uh they you know they kind of came to an agreement that it was going to be me being the sole announcer and that colin cantrell was going to do the houston fights his hometown, which, and I was like, fuck yeah. I mean, like, I, I don't want to take this dude's job completely from him. That that was, to do that made me feel fucking horrible, man. Um, it, it really was, it, it was tough to, to do that. I was like, I wanted the job, but I didn't want it at the, at, at the expense of someone else losing theirs. You know, I've never been in a situation like that. It was, it was extremely uncomfortable. Um, but, uh, I think uh, I, I just think that you know it was it, it, there had to be one and and I, I I devote I could devote all myself to just this one job and I think that that's kind of what got me the the job. I'm not going to say that it was on talent or ability or anything like that. I think it was just it was just the best thing to do for the company to, to decide to do that. And Colin would continue matchmaking and stuff like that and be able to focus more on the, on those types of things. And then, uh, so so then I was next thing you know I was I went from doing fifteen fights a year on TV to doing thirty fights a year on TV, and that was that was crazy, man. That was that was pretty cool, but it was just like in in a lot of ways it was when you're working with the new with the new staff, you're like you're doing an, you're doing an, the LFA RFA style here, and then you got to go do the, the LFA legacy style here, and. <laughs> And it was a tough adjustment for a lot of people. I'm not going to name any names, but it was a tough adjust, adjustment for a lot of people because, you know, 
this matchmaker wanted to make match make all the effect. You know, this, you know, it was it was it was it was tough for people to kind of you know they, they go from doing it all for their organization to only doing half. And I, I think that it was kind of, you know, um, you know, a little bit of a mind fuck for some people. And there was definitely some, you know, pushing and shoving. Uh, no, you can't tell me what to do type stuff. And it, you're not like, you know, you, it, it, it started out really, it started out great, man. But then it just kind of turned into, you know, they, they wanted to restructure some things and some people weren't happy and some people left and, you know, I think a huge thing that that kind of uh, that was kind of a uh, was when Mick Maynard became the matchmaker for the UFC. So now he's not able to put his energy and you know his time and energy into into the that so much, you know. But good for him, dude. I mean, like that's that to become a ma- one of the matchmakers for the UFC. Well, what a great thing that is, you know. And it, it's tough. I'm sure it was a huge decision and tough for him. To make that to make that decision um but uh but yeah so i think that is just kind of you know the legacy parts of this thing you know it wasn't the same without mick around for them and i think that is just kind of you know people would kind of you know just decided to go their own ways or, or there was I, I don't know the back dealing you know the back you know office dealings that went on there but next thing you know it's pretty much just the rfa staff there behind and I'm not going to pretend to know any of the details of the of the merger that happened when London Trust Media Group came in, but uh, but yeah, now it's just pretty much the RFA staff. There's still some some guys like Christian Sutton that, that do the the a lot of the logistic stuff and the setups, and he's still around. But uh, yeah, it was tough. It was a tough adjustment, but adjustment. But you know, things things evolve, things change, and build and grow and uh, I feel here, it. here we are right and speaking of changes there was another big change that happened here pretty recently uh lfa rfa i think uh even way back when uh mfc lion muay thai like all of these fight promotions maybe even ces if i'm remembering correctly we're all on access tv and like i said you remember i would get home on friday nights and be glued to my television watching access TV because that's where all my Friday night fights were. Well, uh, a few months ago, or shit, we might even be coming on a year now, uh, there was a a new owner of access TV and the carpet was kind of pulled out of under uh, all of the fights that were, you know, taking place on that platform. And you guys didn't have a home for a while until Fight Pass pick you up which I don't know how closely you pay attention to social media, but I'll tell you the consensus. The consensus was what the fuck is access thinking bypass UFC. You guys need to make your move, pick up this promotion. It's a fucking no brainer. So that was the consensus online. Uh, but like, talk to me about that. Like how the hell did you guys get through that? I mean, that, that must've been very, very tough definitely definitely was it it was it was it it very much was our the rug was pulled out from under our feet everyone's feet the access tv fights productions feet and everything everything everyone got tossed aside like we weren't shit so fuck those people by the way um i just want to get that out there um but yeah and they, and they got what they got what came to them. I don't know if you know. Did you if you heard about the that wrestling organization that came with that deal? I don't know if I can say it. Can I say the name of the promotion? I don't give a fuck. Impact Wrestling. So okay. Impact Wrestling. So the, and they had their own production staff and everything like that. So they, it's like they got rid of all of the MMA, all the all the MMA guys, the, all the you know Pat Ron. All the camera people, all the engineers, producers, everything. We got fuck all you guys. We got the, we got we got Impact Wrestling coming on. They're gonna they're gonna take over everything. Well, I think they got what they had coming to them because I believe that that there was no contract with the production staff from Impact, and they got and someone came along and fucking jacked them. 
And next thing you know, Action's TV Fights is left with no production staff whatsoever. So, yeah, they had, they, I think it was a bit of a karma that that, 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 kept, that got in there. Um, thank God, because they deserved it. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it was tough. It was tough, but, you know, when you realize what you have with this promotion, uh, knowing what LFA is, it, 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 knowing that our 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 business model it's if you were is very important to the higher to, to ufc it's very important to bellator it's important for the for those those people to have an, a, an organization that develops these fighters that puts the camera that does the interviews that that, that does the green screen the the photo shoots and and makes them do all these things that they have to you know behind the scenes stuff it prepares them for that when they get to the UFC because then it's not so much, oh my gosh, I'm in the UFC and I've never had a camera in my face. I've never done a photo shoot. What am I going to do? It allows those fighters to be more prepared for that. Um, we're, we're, we were very important. So knowing knowing that we were important to the sport gave me comfort knowing that we were getting something, something good was going to happen. Something was, it, it might not be as good or it might be better, you know could be like wow we might go to hbo or to showtime or something like that there's a lot of different kind of rumors that were being thrown around as to who was shopping us up and um it was it was it was it was it was nerve-wracking it was kind of it sucked but then there was but then there was that 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 uh glimmer of maybe this is good this is an ascension this is a move up for us this is going to be something that's going to be you know beneficial and it definitely ended up being that way you know here and never going to be on ufc fight pass and that I was going to be holding a microphone that said UFC on it, dude. It was, it was huge, man. That's that's it's a huge honor, and it's a furtherment of my of my dream for for, for my career and, and for everyone else as well. Um, everything's becoming app based anyway. You know, I don't I haven't had cable in I don't know how many years. You know, uh, but so it, it was it was it was it was it, it was heartbreaking for a lot of people. That lost their jobs because we weren't able to retain all of the production staff. But most of the people that access TV shit canned, we retained, and, and they can. Now they're our producers and whatnot. Um, so that was that was fortunate. But yeah, man, that, that deal was sour as fuck. The way that they handled that was uh, some people. Yep, I one hundred percent agree. And, you know, I think that, just, just now this is just my opinion, but I do think that uh, you guys definitely belong. You know what I mean? You guys already feed so much into the UFC. It only makes sense. You know what I mean? It only makes sense to be, you know, one of, if not the premier organization on the platform. Um because i mean let's just be real there'll be some cards where it's you know almost nothing but lfa rfa or you know legacy alumni on the card so to me the fight pass deal it just made the most sense i don't know dollars or whatever you know what i mean i'm, I'm not going to pretend to know anything about that but from my perspective it's it's where you guys belong i mean it's the ufc it's huge. You know what I mean? It's global. It's, you know what I mean? And then with the fight pass, everything that they're putting on it, I mean, they got their own shows. They got, you know, this, that, the other, you know what I mean? So I think in my opinion, it was probably, you know, one of, if not the best case scenarios, because I mean, HBO or, uh, you know, Showtime would be pretty cool, but I don't have those fucking apps. So, <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got the fight pass one for sure because I'm a fucking, you know, I'm a fiend for that shit. So, you know, it was, you know, and, and that was one thing, you know, are we just going to get lost in the shuffle? Are we just going to be another one of the, you know, I, I don't know how many promotions they do that fight pass has on there, but there's a, there's a lot of them. It's like, I was like, God, man, we're not going to just get lost in the shuffle and, 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 and like that. Are we It's like, but, you know, seeing, seeing the things that I've seen and hearing the things that I've heard, we're definitely not. And uh, we've, we're, we're really settling into our niche of being the premier feeder league to the UFC and to the higher up, you know, organizations. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of pride with that. And we're, we're, we definitely, we love being that. We don't, we've never, I don't think, I mean, I think 
the, in the very, very early stages of RFA, I think that that was kind of a design that they were going to, you know, we we're going to put a lot of, I mean, shit, they had Corey Smith, they had Gilbert Ivel, they had, you know, Tim Elliott, they had um, Jens Pulver, all these, you know, big, huge, you know, names in the UFC. We were putting them on our shows, dude. Like, that, that was a crazy time. But I think that we, we went away from that trying to resurrect, you know, obviously RFA stands for Resurrection Finalized. We're trying to resurrect UFC talent, you know, bringing resurgences for these these fighters that wanted to get back in the sport, not necessarily hang it up. And, uh, and we, we went from that kind of model, which was extremely expensive, to more of a prospects, you know, what's, 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 What's settle into this niche because there's, I mean, everyone and their mom is doing this, but if we can do this really, really well, it's going to be really awesome. And, and Ed Soares and Sven being, you know, man, they've been able in Mark Berry, they've all been, they've, we've been really successful in, in, in doing that. And that's, and it's an honor to be a part of that. Absolutely. I remember uh, one of the early cards, I think it was like RFA 4. Uh, one of the guys that I enjoyed watching, uh, Tyson Griffin, was on the card. I'm just like, what the <laughs> fuck? You yeah. know what I mean? So I'm just like, God damn, these guys are fucking putting in work. You know what I mean? So, And I like the idea of, you know, resurrecting, you know, careers that, you know, maybe fell a little bit short on the higher, you know, on the biggest stages. You know, I thought it was a pretty cool niche. But at the same time, you can only do so much with that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I, I, I I'm, I might I prefer the way that you guys do, uh, you know, building up these prospects, and you guys can't even fucking hold on to them because your matchmaking does such a good job that, you know, the fights are incredible, and fighters are going to you know Bellator one, uh, the UFC or the Contender Series. You know what I mean? So, I think all around you guys do uh, a very good good job all around, not just you with the cage announcing, but Barry and everybody, you know what I mean. I think it's a a good uh, a good organization, not just you know fight wise, but organizationally. I think you guys do a pretty top top notch job. And this is you know coming from you know I've seen some behind the scenes stuff. I've been there for Wayne's. I've seen how you guys you know carry yourselves, and you know I think you guys do a, a fantastic job. Well, thank you very much, man. Uh, we have got a great staff. To, you know, those guys work really hard. To, to put up some good stuff for everybody to watch. But no. Well, so you get uh, you get the merger, and then you get uh, you know the boot from Access. Then you get the the deal with the uh, Fight Pass. But then you get COVID. Okay, so it's like you guys can't catch a fucking break. Okay, because when this COVID hit, uh, me both me and my wife we lost our jobs. You know what I mean? So it wasn't an easy time for a lot of people. I know I struggled. Uh, you know, thankfully, I was able to find a job pretty quickly, um, even at the height of the, the pandemic. And uh, I only say pandemic because here it wasn't that bad, but I still, you know, whatever. But, you know, as a fight organization, like you guys are in professional sports and that was just not. I mean, there was talks of, you know, canceling, you know, seasons or, you know, just sports for the year, uh, you know, maybe even uh, till, you know, later in 2021. And then Dana comes along, pulls off some events. And then you guys, uh, Invicta, you know what I mean? Uh, CES is about to have their first comeback show, I believe. So, like, MMA and now, you know, basketball and football, like, everything's starting to to trickle in but mma was the first sport and you guys introduced something a lot different than you guys have um at least uh, to my memory but you guys started doing things in phases now talk to me about what what you can about how the whole covid19 affected you guys and then the idea to come up with the phases if you were uh, included in those uh, conversations um so yeah, huge. It was a huge blow, dude. I mean, it uh, definitely was like, like, what the hell am I? What the hell? I mean, personally, it was like, well, what the hell am I going to do? Like, and I, I knew what it was going to be. I was going to have to go back to construction. Uh, 
So I went back, luckily found a job uh, building pools, <clears throat> in-ground pools. And, and having the construction background I had, I was able to do pretty well in that and make, make good money. Made great money, actually. And uh, so I was I was, I was was good. So, so I had my job in place. I wasn't going to starve. I wasn't going to have to rob nobody, you know, not to kill nobody. So, but it was definitely like, when are we going to get back to this? When are we going to get going? The UFC's talking about doing it. Are we gonna be uh, are we gonna be doing it too? Just sit tight, Mike. Sit tight. I'm not a very patient person. So <laughs> it was it was nerve wracking. And, and and then as soon as I heard the word, you know, that you know we're we're gonna do this, but we're just gonna, you know, obviously we're not gonna be able to have a crowd that you know, I was excited and a little nervous because it was just gonna be weird. Like so much of my job is it, it so much of what I do is based off of feeding off the crowd and you know, I'm an announcer. I announce the crowds. You know, it's like it's it's going to be weird just announcing to the camera, and, and uh, so doing the events without you know the way that we were doing them, it was it was eerie. It, it was it was very eerie, and um, but luckily we were able to to get them started. That's the good thing about the Midwest, man, is that you know. We're not. We we weren't. We weren't as impacted as much as like the West Coast or the East Coast. You know, when there's people. You, you hear stories of people dying left and right out there, and you're just like, "Does anybody know anybody that has this?" And everyone's like, "No, this is bullshit." You know, you don't. You, you know, you know. It, it, living in the Midwest, you're so kind of just away from all the bullshit. It's you don't see. A lot of things that go on and the impact that it's actually putting on you just kind of live in your you know isolated life out here in the middle of nowhere and but uh but yeah it was it was it was good to get back good good to get back to work even if it was crowdless <laughs> okay and how did the whole phases thing come about oh phases yeah so um so we were gonna so we we had content to make up, you know. So, you know, you have this deal with UFC Fight Pass, and, and and everyone needs to make money. Everyone needs to get back to work. Everyone needs to get going. And uh, so we were just gonna jam out, you know. And, and and a lot of these cards were already put together, you know, but they were just postponed or you know indefinitely. So a lot a lot of the groundwork, I believe, I believe that a lot of the groundwork was already set up for a lot of these events. Mm -hmm. and uh because i noticed that they, they're you know you notice that when there's a lot of denver guys that that was oh that was probably going to be the the broomfield fight you know mm -hmm. this one was going to be this you know sioux falls fight obviously with bryce logan got the championship um but yeah dude we we lived at the holiday inn city center there in sioux falls we first name basis with the front desk you know it's it's a lot you know we had our bubble man and, and when you're there every week, I you get to know the, the the rental car lady really well. And she's hooking you up with upgrades for nothing. You know, it's it, it was it it really was it really was something awesome. But the phases was it was just like okay, so so here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna we're gonna do this many fights, and then we're gonna think about phase two and figure out where we're gonna be able to go from there. But we did phase one, and you know, took a couple weeks off. Did phase two. Pumped four more shows out back to back to back to back. Um, it was just it was crazy to do eight 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 events in in two months, man. It was it was insane. <laughs> it was insane, but man, we got we we got her done. Testament to our staff; they're just resilient, and and there's so much pressure on those guys that that they, that they work their best when they're like that. And it's a testament to our our dudes. Well, and the the phases thing, highly successful. A lot of championship fights, a lot of fighters. Of course, you lose immediately. Uh, Bryce over to uh, Bellator, uh, Demopolis, uh, with her, uh, you know, fucking hail mary over a good friend of mine, Sam. Uh, Sam, you know, yeah, she uh, Demopolis goes over to the Contender Series, and I mean, you guys are. Basically, anybody who put on a good performance in any of these fights, 
uh, that you guys have put on in the past uh, few months, like they're gone. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're already on to, you know, the next phase of their career. So I think it's, first of all, like the way you guys are able to pump out shows and fights fall out all the time, but you guys are dealing with something new where a lot of fighters in upper organizations aren't wanting to fight. So you guys are losing more than usual, but you guys are still able to keep your cards together and they're, they're still amazing. You know what I mean? So I think your staff deserves, you know, just everything. You know what I mean? The the whole organization, because the and again, I'm not trying to sit here and cradle the balls, but at the same time, it's it's amazing what you guys are able to accomplish. Well, and, and, and the reason, I mean, and like you said, you know, there's a lot of people up in the UFC that don't want to fight during these times and they want to be careful they want to know you know their gyms are shut down and they don't want to do that but you know so you ask how, how it's how it's how we're able to kind of facilitate those needs so well it's because there's so many organizations so many like lower organizations like you know the the local regional ones that can't put on events that they can't give their fighters fights so now there's a more de- a demand for people to fight for our organization, even though we're losing all, we're, we're, we're losing our talent to the, not losing, but we're, we're graduating our talent to the UFC and Bellator. Even though we're doing that, there's plenty of, there, there's promotions that have gone under that. There's a, a lot of promotions that have lost everything because they can't have crowds. And, and, and so actually our, our pool, our talent pool is, you know, we actually have a lot more to, to pick from now. Um, and Mark does a great job of, of, of finding those guys. He, he finds them. Just the, the talent that he can come up with and produce is great. But uh, I think it, it has a lot to do with it. You know, even though we're losing so much that those, you know, that, uh, you know, we have kind of a bit, uh, you know, a bigger pool to grab from to, to okay. replace. Fight, so. Definitely. We still don't have fights here. And it's, it sucks because, you know, the guys that I commentate for, uh, Rough MMA, great organization. Uh, you know, they've had uh, fighters like uh, Cortez, who just fought uh, uh, the last UFC card. Um, you know, they've had Ed fight for him. I mean, they've had a lot of good fighters, you know, come through their promotion. Um, it just, they're not able to get back to work. And it's very frustrating because I got to do my first show uh, with them, you know, and we were talking about the next one and I double booked myself, unfortunately, and I wasn't going to be able to make the next one, which sucked because I'm like, I'm finally, you know, starting. And they approached me for the, the opportunity of commentating. I didn't approach them because I had approached a couple organizations and that kind of got the cool shoulder. So I'm like, okay, that's not the way to do it. You got to let them, them come to you. And they did, which is great. I love their staff. You know, all the people that they work with are great, but that show that they were supposed to have that I double booked, it got canceled because of COVID. Oh, wow. And then the next show got canceled. And I mean, it's September, they had a show, you know, it got canceled. So just every month they tried to push it back and it canceled. They tried to push it back and it would just get canceled. And now like, you know, they're still fighting our governor trying to get shows put on and they're, you know, they're setting up protocols that, you know, our state doesn't even require just to, you know, give our, our, you know, government or whatever peace of mind that hey we can do this no crowds you know it'll all be online pay-per-view so you have to watch it from your home you can't get in the arena and watch it you know so they're trying to do everything in their power but still nothing here so it's very frustrating to see just you know all of our fighters not able to and dude we have some fucking killers out here that's just mm-hmm. they can't find fights you know i've had a, a good friend of mine moved to you know kentucky because he's looking for fights i mean it's that bad indeed indeed man it's 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 sad it's sad that this is all going on dude and i I understand why it's just the, the the reasons why aren't 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 prevalent we're in here in the midwest so it's so confusing for us it's it's it this whole covid bullshit i mean and it it's definitely it's it, it's affecting a lot of people. A lot of people are, are, you know, have have died from it. But you know, it's to me, this is just another flu. 
It's just another cold. And I know for a lot of people that that's offensive to hear that because it took somebody that they know's life, you know, but that's, that's just life, man. Like things come along and, and illnesses come along and illnesses, you know, they, they kill people every day, you know, the flu has killed a lot of people. The flu, it's just, it just, it, it, it boggles my mind how, how all of a sudden now because of an illness, that has a potential so very small of killing somebody is now taking over everything. It's taking over our lives. It's affected our lives so greatly. Why? It's, I think it's that it's that question and with, without an answer that really kind of pisses a lot of people off. But you know, it, it really is unfortunate that we that we can't resume our lives the way that we that we were. Why not? So well, it. it you know, it has affected a lot of people. And up until recently, like, I didn't really know anybody who had COVID. Um, I still, you know, if if I needed to wear a mask, I'd wear a mask. If I had to wear gloves, yada, yada, you know, whatever, you know. But the thing was, not until very recently, like, a buddy of mine had a couple friends that he actually, like, you know, trained with in the gym, catch it and die, you know. So I'm like... Well, now I finally know somebody and it fucking sucks. You know what I mean? It, it does. It, it's it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, we're, we're getting put through the ringer by 2020. That has absolutely no fucking chill. I mean, the year's not even over yet. And I just, you know, I can't fucking wait. But, you know, our promotion was on the verge of, you know, some really, really, really big stuff and just, you know, got sat down. And a lot of promotions aren't able to recover. You know what I mean? Just a lot of them. So just seeing what you guys and the UFC and whatever, all that, all these promotions, you know, putting on shows to see what you guys are able to do is pretty incredible. Yeah, it is. It's unfortunately like it's at the expense of, you know, a lot of promotions losing, the, you know, their their businesses, you know, and whatnot, but you know, the show must go on. That's the ultimate thing is that we, we must continue to do sporting events. We must continue MMA. It needs to, it needs, it needs a future because we, we, we lose all these things that have become so such a big part of our culture that, 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 that who the hell are we? You know? but, uh, like I said, I don't want to turn this into the fucking COVID show, but <laughs> it is no. still, it is still very, uh, you know, prevalent, and I think, you know, we'll have to see what happens after November. I mean, really, I think that's what it all boils down to. Yeah. You know, excited for that one way or another. I just want to, I just want to work. I want to provide for my family and, uh, and, uh, and just grow the sport, man. That's my, that's my focus is, is to just continue doing what we're doing, get better and better. And, uh, and that's what that's what we're gonna do. That's what we do, man. That's what that's all we do is just trying to better this sport. Now, you don't have training camps. You don't have uh, uh, victories per se. You know, you still have you know milestones and shit like that. But a question I like to ask uh, my guests, who are usually uh, you know fighters, is about a, a post fight victory meal. Now, given that you don't fight, the question might be have to it might have to be reworded a little bit. But I'm a fat. I fucking eat anything and everything except for like mayonnaise, right? So what is your go-to uh I guess victory cheat, you know, dream? What is that meal for you? <laughs> I drink my I drink my calories close fight, bro. <laughs> I do, I, I do. Like uh, like the hotel bar there at Holiday Inn. Uh, the one in Sioux Falls really was really really cool. Uh, but yeah, dude, uh, Long Island iced teas, bro. You know, usually when we're getting done with the fights, you know, it's you know eleven eleven thirty at night. And we got to power hour it up, dude. So, yeah, I usually just get my drink on. Uh, there's some pizza floating around. 
delivery pizza or something like that, sure. But there's not a post fight meal, really. It's 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 usually cocktails in a you know a lot. It's a you know the the events are it's a long three days. We work pretty much morning till till evening, and you know every day, and, and uh, it's kind of it comes to fruition at the end of the event. At that time, it's just like you just want to drink, so that's what I do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for good stories. Thanks for good stories. You know. Uh, when you're when you hang out with these guys in hotels all the time, I mean, listen, like Pat doesn't drink, but he, he but like some of the post fight stories that that you know that I've heard, ugh, just just the stories from Pat Militich and the one that made this career very enjoyable. <laughs> he's got some good ones. Yeah, he's been through some shit. He's drinking, drinking creates memories, it's, and road trips create memories as well. Man. Good, good stuff to carry with it. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. I appreciate you taking a, taking the time out of your day. We've been here for fucking almost two hours of nothing but good shit, you know, getting to know, you know, how, how transitions went through parts in your career and how you got started. All that shit was all stuff I was very interested in. Very, very, very pumped to, you know, get this one done. It's the editing's going to be a minute. So <laughs> bear with me there. But uh, do you got any like sponsors or any affiliates or anything that you'd like to uh, that, that, that help like sponsor, or promote you that you want to put out there? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm looking for, um, I guess I will, I'll talk about that later, but um, black oxygen. Black Oxygen Organics. Uh, it's been a it's been a supplement that that's I, I don't even like calling it a supplement, man. It's been a life changing thing for me. Being uh, being fat and hurt and, and and broken from all the years of doing the stuff that I've done. This 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 particular thing, Black Oxygen, is is given me kind of a second chance at doing a lot of things. Uh, my lungs are trashed. Uh, you know, breathing in concrete dust all the time. So getting through workouts has always been tough to actually be able to do as much work as I wanted to do. Um, but uh, the, the full of care of from Black Oxygen, it's been able to, it, it, it makes me work out and want more. Like I'll go, I used to go for a two mile walk and, and be, just be done. And like, I'm fucking done. I got it done. Cool, cool, cool. But I get home from after a two mile walk. I can't, like I, I can keep going. I can still do this. I'm not breathing heavy. I do workouts that I used to just die through and I, I'm able to, I, I'm not breathing heavy at all. It's just like, wow, how, how awesome it is for your body to have so much more availability to oxygen, which is what it does. Um, and it, it's, it's a huge thing. So not, not only, and not, I'm, I'm not just promoting this. They don't sponsor me. I, I, I guess I, I kind of, I have a shopping, I have a site where you can shop and I can get credit for things. I haven't even checked to see if, how much money I've made off it or anything like that. I'm more so just interested in, in what it's doing for me and my body. The things that I've heard in testimonies are just amazing. I've heard of people coming off of hospice, you know, um, you know, people that are afflicted with cancer, their lives dramatically changed for the better. Not that it's curing anything like that. It's a cure or treat. Or prevent anything we you can't say that it does that but like the stories about what this stuff what this stuff is doing is is, is amazing um so black oxygen or organics.com backslash mike underscore kendall is where you guys can find that stuff and, and, and read the uh read the testimonies that are that are that have uh, the people that this this product has, uh, has affected in a positive way are amazing so so that um i guess uh at a nemesis fighting alliance fight, I met Nick Sampson, man, and that dude is like shit. He's a man's man. He's the coolest dude on the planet. HKA USA. Um, yeah, it's been really cool. They designed some some gloves for me. I like to hit mitts and I like to hit the bag and, and stuff like that a lot. They they developed some. Uh, uh, the, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So they got the Are you ready for war ones? Uh, that they're gonna. I'm gonna when I go out to this event later this month. I think it's the 24th of October. I'm going to I'm gonna pick up those gloves from them and take some pictures and stuff like that. But hanging out with Nick, he's the coolest dude on the planet. 
So definitely want to see see good things for HKA USA. Those those guys are awesome. They deserve all the success they get. And uh, um, that's pretty much it, man. Shout out to my girlfriend for dealing with my ass all the time and leaving and, and, and you know being gone. You know, days on end. I'm sure by the time it comes time for my five trips, she's kind of ready for me to go because I because <laughs> I don't. Is I don't I don't you know I don't have another job so I'm you know I'm home you know four days a week and and bored and she takes the brunt of it you know so I appreciate her and her support for me all over the you know for the, you know for the time that we've been together and been able to deal with me it's, she deserves a, a shout out for sure um, but yeah that's pretty much it I'm looking well, again. At- Oh, yeah, yeah. I want, to, I want a suit sponsor, motherfuckers. I want a suit yeah. sponsor and a watch sponsor. Like, come on. Yeah. Somebody, I, I, somebody I think you know, we need to talk about that at least for a second before I let you go. Uh, how many suits and how many watches and how many pairs of kicks do you got? Because I know the, our announcer, he's got like. 50 or 100 somewhere in there different suits different shoes and all of his shit is custom he doesn't rent you know what i mean so like i'm not an announcer i got one suit and i barely fit into it you know what i mean dude i wear it till it fucking falls apart bro my god or or, or or if i get skinny i have i have probably two to three suits that i've held on to because i spent a little bit of money on them and i'm kind of praying that i'll get my ass back in shape and get down to those um but like right now i wear one suit and it's you know, it's it's hurting it's starting to it, it gets dry clean and so off so often you know or pressed so often that you know it's bubbling up on the sleeve hopefully no one pays attention to that and watches it it's like oh yeah i can see it you know but uh but yeah dude i have one one suit i just bought it i just i just re- i just cycled out by the black shirt that i wear under my suit it's starting to fade and burn from the pressing so much. So I got rid of that. I just bought a new shirt. And uh, October's here, so I'm gonna, uh, I am got a little you know, pink tie that I'll be, I'll be wearing for the rest of the month. Um, but, yeah, dude, like I have, I have one pair of dress shoes that I just got not too long ago, and I get like $25 pair because I just go through them like crazy. So, yeah, if there's a sponsor out there that could <laughs> – Outfit a guy, man. I fucking love it. But, um, you know, other, other than that, until until then, I'm just gonna keep doing what I do. Go to Burlington Coat Factory, get some cheap suits, and wear them until they fall apart. So, well, hopefully, this reaches some people, and <laughs> they get their shit together and give you a call. I mean, it's they, you might get some airtime. You might get some. Yeah, that was the thing, man. I was just, I, I, was, I was like, man, might. Like, why would it, why what has why is nobody like it is like kind of like a little arrogant a little for me to think like i'm on tv why is it so hard for me to find someone that'll buy me you know that'll that'll provide some suits for me that wants you know that wants their product aired on you know on global television why you know but it just hasn't been anything that's that's presented itself so if it happens it happens if not i'll just continue doing what i do it's not a big deal i wear all black suits anyway just because I don't like blood. I don't like people seeing blood splatter on my shirts. So I don't wear. I don't wear white stuff anymore. Yeah, you, you get showered with blood every every event. So, yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, thank you for the time. This has been awesome. This has been, like I said, I was pumped for this one. Like truly pumped. I really admire your work. I have been for a very long time. I get to see you more often than I get to see the fighters. You know what I mean? So really getting to pick your brain and, you know, find out where where all of this, you know, work came from definitely was interesting to me, even if fucking nobody watches it, which that's impossible. But I'm, I'm glad for me to get this one done. You're only the second announcer I've ever interviewed. And the other one was, you know, with with my guy. So, yeah. Well, man, it's, an, it's a huge honor to, you know, to, for someone, you know, like I said, for someone to see uh, the work that I'm putting in, I mean, I don't expect, 
I don't expect to be put on any sort of pedestal or anything like that. The, the, the glory belongs to the fighters that really, really put in the work and to the staff that put these events on and put them together that work, you know, every day, all day, every day, literally, to put on these events. Man, I'm just, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to be a small part of all of that. And, um, and couldn't imagine doing anything, anything else. Man, I, this is what I, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, just, it's, it's, it's an honor for someone to, to you know, to, Hey, you know, I want an announcer on there, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty cool, man. And I got been announcing for 12 years and it's, it's been a, quite a ride, man. Anytime you ever want to chop it up, dude, I'm definitely down. Oh, for sure. I'll be hitting you. <laughs> I'll be hitting you. We just blew through two hours like it was nothing. Sure, sure. Yeah. And there's I mean there's plenty of more, man. There's a lot of things that we've that we've done, things I've seen and and um you know, which watching these watching these fighters watching the fighter win the belt and just re, just seeing like the realism Feel you can feel it, dude. Like when you're right, when you're right there, especially when you're right behind them announcing them, you can feel that that energy of like, wow, I like, I've he's achieved something. He's 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 well on his way to living out his ultimate dream of fighting in the UFC or Bellator and whatever it may be. But like that is that's what it's all about, man. And I, 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 that's what I love the most about Ed Soros is, is that is that he loves to be to be that part. He loves to be the part of. You know, he could very easily run a promotion that's as big as Bellator or something like that, you know. But he loves being the part of seeing, helping people to to achieve their dreams, you know, helping helping lift them up and raise them up. And, and, and that's why I like him so much is because we're both on the same page when it comes to that. It's, it's a huge honor to be a part of those, you know, that moment in these kids' careers, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, like I said, two fucking hours, like it wasn't nothing. Yeah. Hell yeah. It wasn't nothing, man. I'm sitting here watching the clock like, no shit, two hours already, huh? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, hopefully, still... hopefully there's some decent content in there, man. I don't know. It's kind of like a, you know, just. No, no, no. Absolutely. And like I said, this was. It's something that I was very interested in and in, in happened on my show, you know what I mean? Uh, getting your perspective and, you know, some of the things that you go through and your, your prep work and all that shit. It's fascinating to me. So I think uh, I can't be the only motherfucker out there, you know what I mean? Plus, you work, you know, with one of the best organizations in the world. And that's not an opinion. That's a fact. OK, sure. You know what I mean? So we, be, I, we believe that we're the number three organization on the planet. That's that. I mean, you might not get that. You might. I mean, it might not be reality, but to us, with the, 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 the from what we've seen and from what we do, I mean, we don't. Of course, across the the, the ocean, you, they. I'm sure there's organizations that are just like us out there. But I mean, we. I'm. We. I don't. I don't really expand my scope out that far dude I'm so we're so busy with doing the events everything is kind of like right here in front of us um we're de i definitely believe we're number three in organization in, in in the world because it's 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 proof when you see when you when you're scrolling through my instagram feed it's you know so and so to the ufc so and so to bellator it's every day someone's fucking signing that has come through our organization it's fucking it's it's mind-blowing but yet it's like of course because we're, we're grabbing, we're, we're pulling up the talent, the best talent from around the country and from other countries, Brazil and in Russia. And I mean, we're truly an international feeder. So yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's, it's an honor to be a part of it all. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm glad that you guys don't really uh, like book over top of the UFC because there's a lot of, you know, LFA alum, you know, from the family and beyond that that perform. So I watch those guys come through your organization. So of course I want to see them compete on the bigger stage. But I will tell you this: no offense to Bellator, uh, but they kind of do a, a shitty job at letting me know uh, when how to watch their cards. So it's very difficult. But if they book on top of LFA, it's it's LFA for me. 
So you can take wow. that shit to the bank. Yeah. Huh. I, I, I posted it on my uh, on my social media account that uh, if you know if LFA and Bellator are on on the same night, I'll catch the 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 rerun of Bellator. Or, you know, stream it later because LFA is uh, you know you guys have also treated me real treated me well as an organization. You know what I mean? I work a lot with Ryan and he sent me a, a ton of interviews, you know, and he, if, if I fuck something up, like I did the other night, uh, I was running on fumes. I posted an interview with Sam Hughes and uh, he's like, she's a straw weight. And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> I think I put flyaway. You know what I mean? So <laughs> and he's on top of his shit. If I fuck something up, he lets me know right away so that I can fix it. You know what I mean? So you guys have always treated me, you know, with the utmost respect. And, you know, you guys fill me in on some shit that I'm not sure if, you know, a lot of other uh, podcasts or whatever get it. But, you know, I get some some insider shit, too. You know, probably shit I shouldn't know. So, you know. Sure. Of course, that's all under lock and key until it's ready for general public. You know what right. I mean? But uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm trusted uh, with with some you know pretty cool shit. So uh, you guys have always been cool to me. And your fights, I mean, everything, the organization, you know, it, just from start to finish, I fucking love it. So if, like I said, if it's Bellator versus uh, LFA, sorry Scott, yeah. sorry Scott, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. all right man well i can't wait for the next one uh I, like i said i'll uh i'll tag you up on all the socials once i get this thing up uh expect it to be a minute because i do have to get this bad boy uh edited and i don't think i've done a two-hour one yet so no this will be it. take your time dude there's no rush um uh as far as like so, can i put my social medias out there and do it do it yeah absolutely so yeah, on Instagram it's uh, at Mike Kendall LFA. Of course, on Facebook it's just Mike Kendall. Uh, I have a Mike Kendall LFA uh, uh, business page, but I'm never on it. So yeah, I, I don't mind accepting friend requests as long as people are not too creepy. But uh, I, I'm not really on Twitter much. But yeah, my Instagram at Mike uh, at Mike Kendall LFA. That's that's probably my favorite platform these days. All right, and what I'll do is I'll get it uh, across the screen a few times throughout the uh, the entire interview. Wow. Bless you. Uh, no, yeah. Bless cool you. Deal. But uh, you. like I said, I'll have that on there, and then, like I said, I'll tag you up. Dude, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely a blast. a blast. And like I said, I can't wait till the next one. Will you enjoy the rest of your day? I know you got kids to pick up here pretty soon, so. No worries, you do yeah. Thing. What's, we should do something like we could we could do this maybe like do like a year end thing maybe just like once or twice a year you know just like a year end because I I know that I have my schedule is a lot less busy like in like December I think I only have like two events in December um, but do something like that and then maybe just reconnect maybe mid year next year or something like that would be cool other than that you know the comment or whatever on social media I'll get back to you. Absolutely, man. I'd probably, I'm down with that. One hundred percent, man. Well, it was a pleasure to have you, and like I said, you do you, and I will see you on Friday. The enjoy the show, bro. Enjoy the show, bro. Absolutely, man. Thank you for your time. No problem.